So um, uh, I'm going to give my second lecture today, and we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, we talked about this uh, symmetry breaking of thermally fluctuating sheet polymers motivated by um, spectrin and graphene. Um, uh, and uh, uh, today, um, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about statistical mechanics on cones. I always had thought that cones were pretty boring because they have zero Gaussian curvature most of the time, um, but uh, they, I find, are, are somewhat charming. <laughs> so I hope to convince you uh, that, uh, that they might have some reason uh, for your attention. Uh, Friday, we'll uh, return to this question of these sheet polymers, but I'll talk about um, you, you're now prepared for Friday's uh, overview talk of some recent developments about uh, mutilated uh, sheets and shells. So I'll be giving that, I guess, on Friday afternoon. As always, um, the, this lecture will only be as good as your questions. Um, I'm very confident that there will be questions because you've been so uh, proactive uh, during the week that I've been here and the questions have been great. So, uh, so please keep them coming. This will be mostly, almost entirely a, a PowerPoint uh, lecture. So that's all the more reason for questions. Um, uh, some people say that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Uh, it makes it too easy to throw uh, a, a fire hose uh, of uh, information at you. And so uh, the questions are all the more important because I'm doing PowerPoint. Um, and I know Sri Ram will need no encouragement to interrupt, but but I know that uh, the others, of course, could have questions too, and I hope you'll, you'll interrupt. So I want to talk about frustration and defects um, on crystals. It's a fairly uh, old subject. There's a beautiful poster outside which asks, shows what happens when you twist these barrels and catenoids uh, building on this work by William Irvine and uh, Paul Chaikin and Vincenzo Vitelli. Um, there's a work that goes back to 2003 by Andreas Bausch and Dave Waits, where they see these grain boundary scars, uh, an integral part of the ground state of colloidal crystals uh, on oil droplets. And um, grain boundaries typically uh, have been thought of in material science as uh, non-equilibrium uh, history dependent effects where two crystals collide. But here they really seem to be a part of the ground state. And what you're seeing are these five, seven, five, seven chains. Each five, seven pair can be thought of as a dislocation and chains of dislocations are one way of modeling uh, a grain boundary. So that's, a, that's an example of how um, the geometrical frustration associated with Gaussian curvature um, plays uh, an important role um, in uh, dictating ground states of ordered, uh, ordered systems. Uh, and the Gaussian curvature plays a big role. Um, you can also have frustration, not from the curvature, but I'll talk about this on the next slide, from boundary conditions. And, and this is a, 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 um, a recent experiment that was, I got it from the bioarchive, of the pattern uh, of uh, bumps in a, in a, in a, uh, a di diatom shell. Uh, the shell sort of looks like the top of a Petri dish. There's a bottom of a Petri dish as well. And I'll talk about the pattern of defects here, uh, but uh, what Eric Dufresne and his lab has done is to uh, show the fives and sevens uh, in this case. Uh, and here are, are some other examples. We'll come back to these, uh, a little bit to these uh, conical uh, coral projections, which have little bumps, which somehow have to live on a cone rather than in the plane. And this is beautiful work um, on the theoretical side. It was done by David Lubensky, uh, and it has to do with uh, the patterning of the individual cells in fish retina. And these uh, yellow uh, lines are in fact grain boundaries. And uh, they uh, are an essential part of the, the ground state in the sense of these cellular packings. Uh, this is cut open. And so you sort of see this uh, like the petals of a flower here. Um, so that's the motivation for where we're headed. Um, and let me just uh, contrast um, uh, 
frustration arising from boundary conditions and geometrical frustration around, arising from uh, Gaussian curvature. So here's this uh, Dufresne lab experiment on, on, on diatoms and uh, uh, you know, how they reproduce and uh, maintain these kinds of patterns is a fascinating question in its own right. But the pattern itself is influenced by the fact that as you slide around the edge, the local crystalline order, the bonds that make up the crystal are slowly rotating by 360 degrees. So there's a 360 degree rotation superimposed on this crystal. And the question is, how is it going to respond? Uh, it can't be a, a perfect crystal that doesn't have the right rotation. Uh, and uh, what seems to happen in some intriguing way is this pattern of fives and sevens that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, there's a kind of frustration here that doesn't have anything to do with curvature per se. Uh, but if I look, for example, at these uh, blue red pairs, these, these seven five pairs, uh, you can see that they typically point radially outward. And I can even draw a string of arrows here, which looks sort of like a sloppy grain boundary. And so grain boundaries are one possible uh, response to this uh, slow uh, two pi rotation uh, as I go around uh, this, uh, this flat diatom uh, shell. Um, of course, there are grain boundaries in the ground state also when you have Gaussian curvature, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, and the interplay between curvature frustration and uh, boundary uh, condition frustration, uh, I find is quite subtle and interesting. And just to give you an example, and again, in a crystalline context, liquid crystals are coming, um, you can look uh, at what happens to uh, uh, grain boundaries starting in a plane. So here we have a flat plane, but now this flat plane is actually a five-fold disclination, has a five-fold disclination here. And if you look at what's happening at the edge, uh, there's a rotation, uh, if you add them all up, of the crystal orientation of 60 degrees. And uh, in fact, uh, if you go along this path, there's a 12 degree rotation, and then there's this, this little angle that's just a symmetry operation. So I won't count that, another 12 degrees, another 12 degrees. So it's much in the spirit of this diatom, and you work out the energy of this thing, it's got a lot of stretching. You just can't get rid of the stretching. And it actually is an energy that's proportional to the uh, radius of the system squared. It goes like the area uh, and with the Young's modulus out in front. So there's a stretching energy. Now, if you insist that this thing remains flat, you can lower the energy a bit by, as was done up here, putting in grain boundaries. And uh, here's a, a proposed grain boundary that uh, Mike Moore and collaborators uh, studied a, a long time ago. And you, again, you see 7575, five, and these, these grain boundary arms will just go out to infinity in flat space. And what that does is to relax the strains in between the arms. So those are more or less strain free, but then there's a whole uh, line of dislocation core energies that you have to deal with. Um, uh, to uh, estimate the energy, and that's proportional to R. B is like a, a Burgers vector or a lattice spacing. Um, and uh, so now the energy is not R squared, it's linear in R. So that's one way of dealing with this frustration. But you can get um, uh, rid of the grain boundaries entirely if you just take this thing and relax it into the third dimension. Because um, once, once you do that, uh, there are, there's no need for grain boundaries anymore. Um, the, the, you get this uh, conical uh, disclination and um, uh, the energy, it turns out, is just logarithmic in R and it's proportional to that bending rigidity that I was talking about yesterday. So somewhere between here and here, if I gradually deform this thing into a cone of just the right angle, the grain boundaries go away. How they go away, I don't know. Uh, maybe they go you know, from five to four to three, or maybe the spacing between the dislocations just gets longer and longer and they just sort of vanish uh, in some fashion. But that's just to convince you that this is a, a subtle problem. 
Now I'm not gonna solve this problem per se, um, but I'm gonna solve an easier version of it. And that's going to be the liquid crystal version. So solids have orientational order and translational order, but liquid crystals just have the orientational part. And that's also affected by boundary conditions and by frustration, as we'll see. Um, and here's a famous, yes, please, question. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can go back here. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, th th this is this is actually circle. This thing at the top. Sorry. Go back here. Th th this thing at the top. It's it's like the top of a petri dish. It's just a flat circle. And and, and but then I, I I do have this curved thing here. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so here's a famous problem of uh, putting a vector field on a uh, on a sphere. And uh, you know you can't comb the hair of a sphere. And here's the North Pole, and then there's a uh, a plus one vortex of the North Pole. You won't be surprised to learn there's a minus. There's a plus one again at the South Pole. And if you can work out the energy of this texture in a one franc constant approximation, it's logarithmic in the radius, um, and so forth. It gets a little more interesting if I take the vector symmetry uh, and uh, I. Uh, I make it a double-headed arrow. I make it in, into a pneumatic, okay, that, that, that uh, has a, a, a double-headed arrow symmetry. Uh, and if I do that, um, what happens, let's look at the North Pole uh, with these pneumatogens now. Uh, this plus one defect, the North Pole, because it's now double-headed arrow can decay into two plus one half defects. They repel each other, turns out logarithmically. They get as far apart as they can. Um, and if that happens at both the North Pole and the South Pole, uh, the result uh, is this uh, uh, American baseball. So here's, here's an American baseball. I'll pass around. Um, its patent is uh, in 1861. And it has four defects, as you'll see when I pass this around, sit sitting at the vertices of a tetrahedron. So two, two defects go to four, they repel, they get as far apart as possible, they sit at the vertices of a tetrahedron. And somehow somebody thought of turning this uh, into a, uh, some kind of uh, uh, sports object. So I'll start passing this around. Uh, and uh, uh, so in fact, the energy of this object here uh, is lower than the energy of, of this uh, object here. So it pays to fractional, to, to, to have the defects partition into the smallest quantum they can get, which in this case is, is one half. Okay, so um, the, uh, how do we comb the hair of a sphere? Well, there's a Poincare hop theorem, much beloved by mathematicians and physicists. And it says that the, neck, the net defect charge, given the integrated Gaussian curvature uh, of a sphere, has to be exactly plus two. So there are two plus one defects here. There are four plus one half defects there. I'm gonna show you in a sense uh, how to violate this theorem later in the talk. Okay, so it doesn't have to be two-fold or one-fold symmetric liquid crystals. Liquid crystals, uh, here's an example of an experiment with cross polarizers. It's a distorted tetrahedron of the kind that I talked about. It's a liquid crystal shell. Um, so this is this basically an example of this baseball texture. Uh, you could have a tilted smectic C lipid bilayer or a vesicle, and it would have the arrows, so the P equals one symmetry uh, shown down here. Um, and uh, recently, uh, there's a group in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, Dylan Sislo uh, et al, and uh, they looked uh, at the development of the cells in a shrimp, and they found something with tetradic bond orientational order, not translational order, but long range or a square lattice kind of orientation. Uh, there's a beautiful experiment that many of you probably know, especially in the field of active matter. Uh, Zervadimir Dojic and Andreas Bausch et al. looked at microtubules and molecular order, uh, molecular motors uh, 
pressed uh, against the inside walls of a vesicle. And the motors made this an example of active matter. There still have to be the four defects and these sort of buzz around in various orbits. Here you can see three of them here, like a topological clock. Here's a, a final example. Um, this is uh, some simulations by, by Kiyomara. Uh, it's a function of temperature and then a parameter in one of these um, uh, models of cells squishing together. And there's a parameter that tells you something about the energetics of uh, the perimeter versus the area. So that's another parameter. And, and sneaking in here is this purple hexatic phase that has sixfold orientational order, not twofold. So we can have one, two, four, uh, and six. Maybe we could have five and three. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but there are all these piatic things that uh, we can ask about. We can ask about the effect of boundary conditions, and we can ask about the effect of uh, geometrical frustration. Question? Yeah, I was just wondering, where in that picture is the epithelial to mesenchymal transition happening? Um, this one, this one here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, the uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, in, in my my guess, I'm not an expert, is that when you go from see what's interesting about this phase diagram, Shiram, is that there's a first order transition from liquid to hexatic, but the transition from hexatic to solid is continuous, and so the idea is that. Um, the epithelium would be in, in some kind of solid phase. And then when it goes hexatic, it becomes fluidized, has a finite shear viscosity and it can move. And there's pretty good reasons if the, that shear viscosity comes about from dislocations to think it's gonna diverge in this strange um, uh, um, Volger, focal, full, Volger focal, whatever it is, 0.37 power uh, in the exponent. Uh, and, and so you can get a tunable um, shear viscosity over several orders of magnitude. And I don't know that it's been observed directly in this context, but it has been observed in equilibrium vesicles, which seem to have a hexatic phase. And so it's something I think worth keeping in mind that tunable 2D shear viscosities over several orders of magnitude are hard to come by theoretically. Other questions? Okay. Um, so. Uh, that gives uh, me uh, an, a long introduction to the talk itself, which is defect emission and absorption for liquid crystals on cones. And the talk will, uh, I've already talked about the first subject, really, orientational order. We'll talk, we'll go back briefly, talk about disks and the role of boundary conditions and liquid crystals there. Then we'll talk about parallel transport on a cone. And I'd like to try to convince you that this is a soft matter analog of the uh, aronoff bohm effect. Um, it, it, it doesn't have interference fringes per se, but it has something very much like that. And <clears throat> the delta function of Gaussian curvature at the tip of this cone plays the role of the flux through a solenoid uh, when you look at uh, the quantum mechanical interference of an electrons going around either side in a double slit experiment. Um, and then we'll talk about very recent work, uh, liquid crystal defect dynamics near the cone apex. This is work by Farzan Fafa and uh, Amin Dost Mohammadi. And if I have time at the end, I'll tell you about um, hyperbolic cones. Um, any questions about where we're going? Okay, so uh, these are the people who did the hard work, um, Farzan Fafa and Grace Zhang. This is part of her thesis. Yeah, Farsan is a postdoc, and uh, you can read about it in these papers here. And there's another paper, which is uh, JPCM in press. So I like cones. I ended up liking them a lot um, because although they're locally flat, you can take a cone and, and, and cut it open. So here I have an example uh, of a cone, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Here's a cone. You know, if I, if I just cut it along the seam, if I just cut this cone along a seam, it just unrolls and it's boring flat thing. But of course it has to join along the seam. And uh, that's what uh, gives rise to some interesting stuff. And there's this delta function of Gaussian curvature. Uh, there's biological examples of cones. We've already talked about 
this one with a coral reef. These hydras have limbs at some stage in development that protrude out. And if you were to follow this limb up here, its tip might look a bit like a cone. And uh, the cells are packed in some interesting way. And there's the dynamics of how this cone forms. I'll be looking at frozen cones, but <clears throat> I think it's quite interesting to look at the dynamics of cones as well. And of course, in the armpit, uh, armpits of this hydra, you have a localized source of negative uh, Gaussian curvature. Um, and there's some cute mathematics. I won't go into the details, but um, it was first realized, not for cones, but in a more general context by Vitelli and Turner, that um, when you have a Gaussian curvature <clears throat> on any surface as a function of these coordinates u, um, uh, there's a, a, a geometrical potential um, which determines, uh, uh, influences where these defects go. If you have multiple defects on a curved surface, they interact with each other, of course, but they also interact with the background Gaussian curvature. And so if they're on a, a torus, for example, there'll be an interaction <clears throat> uh, there as well. And the, the defect interaction at coordinate U has a geometrical potential with this prefactor uh, that, that uh, I won't go into the details here, but the geometrical potential is the solution of Laplacian of the geometric potential equals whatever the Gaussian curvature is. If that Gaussian curvature is a delta function, then we sort of have a Green's function type problem. This is the, the simplest thing you can write down that will tell you something about this geometrical potential and, 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 and more complicated surfaces you could imagine in some vague way are a superposition of delta functions smeared out of a negative and positive Gaussian curvature with different magnitudes. So that's, <clears throat> that's where we're headed. And uh, now let's talk about boundary conditions. Boundary conditions uh, are gonna be illustrated for this uh, Meyer-Selpa model of a p attic liquid crystal. All you need to know about it is it's a bunch of uh, vectors with a p-fold symmetry. There's a p equals one example here on a lattice. And they have some dot product interaction between nearest neighbors, just like a two-dimensional xy model. If I subtract a one here, I just subtract a constant and expand this thing out. Uh, it's uh, proportional to the gradient. It's an energy proportional to the gradient of the phase squared here. Uh, so there's these little vectors that are, uh, this dot product would be a cosine, and then there's a P here to give you a P-fold symmetry if you want to have something other than P equals one. Now for free boundary conditions with a disk, uh, the um, ground state is absolutely trivial. They're all pointing in the same direction. No one would be surprised at that. Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> if I have tangential boundary conditions just for the director, the director here or the directions, um, uh, so there's a two pi rotation, something more interesting happens. And uh, you, what you're forcing on the system here uh, by going around two pi with a pneumatic or a tetradic or a hexadic is a, is a rotation uh, of this angle, which can be accommodated by having uh, an integer number of, of charges, of, of topological charges inside this flat disk. If it's p equals one, it's the, 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 uh, this, this thing you're forcing in stays at the origin, but just like the North Pole of that uh, baseball that I was passing around, um, for p equals two, this breaks into two uh, one half, uh, plus one half charges. For p equals four, it, it breaks into four one quarters. Here it breaks into uh, uh, six uh, fra uh, fraction uh, charges. It, they, 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 they repel each other. They don't go all the way to the edge because to satisfy this tangential boundary condition, it turns out you need like signed image charges outside uh, the, the disk. It's a, a standard trick in electrostatics uh, to solve these kinds of, of problems. And uh, Farsan uh, Fafa was able to show that the radius for a p attic of these fractioned, fractionated charges uh, is given by this formula here. And that's pretty good agreement with our um, numerical uh, determinations of various ground states. This is just a warm up. I want you to now to imagine uh, taking the center of this disc and letting it rise up to form a cone. And so we'll be talking about what happens then. You have to of course do some differential geometry for a cone. This is a, uh, a cone with a, a half angle 
um, that is beta. So beta is going to pop up every now and then. This is the normal vector. Uh, this is a parameterization for a frozen beta. And you navigate around the cone by uh, looking at R and, <clears throat> and then this angle theta. Um, and you can work out the metric tensor and so forth. Um, and the uh, interesting thing is you just apply gauss bonnet theorem to a cone. There's a delta function at the tip. So this um, uh, K is the Gaussian curvature. Uh, there's a theorem that says for uh, something with a topology of a disk, which includes a cone, uh, this is the geodesic curvature. You do take, take any loop here, this loop here, this loop here, calculate this surface integral inside that loop over the conical surface, add this line integral, that has to be exactly two pi. And um, this lovely theorem basically says that although the Gaussian curvature, you can see that you know, if you work out the Gaussian curvature from this with this metric, it's zero everywhere, except something funny happens at the origin. You want to figure out what happens, integrate over the origin, and uh, it's always equal to two pi chi, no matter where this loop is, and no matter what shape it is. I've shown circular loops here, but it's quite general. And so chi is our, going to be our measure of how pointy the cone is. Um, <clears throat> so chi equals zero means it's a flat disk. And then as chi can go all the way up to one as the cone gets pointier and pointier. So <clears throat> to convince yourself there's really something there, even though it's locally flat, if you unroll the cone, you can do the following experiment. I'll do it on my head. I've done this for some of you already. I apologize to, for the repetition. This, but my head happens to be approximately spherical. I'm not a cone head, as far as I can tell, uh, as in Saturday Night Live. Um, but so if I take this and, and, and just follow this vector, uh, parallel transporting it up a geodesic to the top of my head, Sidney Coleman, I think was the first person I saw do this, come down to my ear with parallel transport, come over, I've rotated by 90 degrees. And uh, turns out if you do that little exercise, with the connection coefficients and parallel transport, a vector uh, uh, like a liquid crystal uh, order parameter around a, a cone with this particular angle, uh, it rotates also, in this case, it rotates by uh, 180 degrees. And uh, that's gonna produce a challenge for this vector field to find a state of low energy. Um, and again, this is somewhat like the R enough Bohm effect. Or you could say, in a less less uh, a ponderous way, uh, it's like uh, a Mubia strip uh, texture going around uh, as you should loop around this thing. Um, and uh, we, we, I'll show you some of the results of some numerical uh, computations. And you have to be a little careful on a cone because you have to lay down a mesh, and uh, you want to be careful about laying down uh, a mesh that doesn't itself have uh, artific artificial grain boundaries and singularities, but there are a bunch of discrete values of, of chi. Here are uh, five of them. There are two others that you can get from a square lattice uh, that aren't included here. There's also another one at chi equals zero, but for these values of chi, we have a nice mesh and then except at the tip, it turns out what happens to the tip doesn't matter. You can cut off the tip. You know, the results that I'm gonna tell you about don't change. Um, you can get a nice mesh work here that uh, lets us study these field theories. Any questions? Okay, so um, minimize, we want to minimize this, the cone energy uh, that's that associated with these uh, little liquid crystal model, mo models on a lattice. Um, lattice is just a computational convenience. And we have a tunable amount of geometrical frustration as we crank up this value of chi. So let's take a look um, at what happens in more detail. Um, this model that I had for the disk uh, acquires a, 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 a rotation, a preferred rotation because it's sitting on a cone. Um, and as you move around, especially if you move around a loop that uh, encompasses uh, the, the apex, uh, th there's gonna be a vector potential that you, uh, something like a vector potential, it's actually a connection coefficient. Uh, and in the continuum limit, it looks a lot like a superconductor uh, with a non-zero magnetic field. Um, and 
uh, you can work out what this vector potential is. Um, and then for different values of chi, you can repeat that little experiment and look at the rotation of one of these, of our reference vector uh, that could be attached to a p attic and it rotates by a, a, a tunable amount. And we have to find uh, the ground state of a whole stack of uh, imagine rings of uh, lattice sites uh, populated by these vectors. Um, it's a whole stack of Möbius strip like textures. Uh, this simple thing that I would get uh, by just minimizing this absolute value squared, that's just gonna produce a, a constant rotation rate on this angle, but it's not gonna match when it goes around. And if you don't do something else to relax this Möbius strip a bit, you're gonna get a huge um, energy cost. The question is what actually happens? And as you'll see, what happens depends on the boundary conditions. So um, there can be useful to uh, basically make a gauge transformation. It's like uh, it's, it's gonna be actually unrolling uh, the, uh, these uh, uh, cones just to flatten them out. Um, it's a change of variables if you prefer. Um, and uh, here, here's what happens on a cone. You could talk about little loops. Either the loop might, might enclose a defect it might enclose some, in this case, it encloses two defects and the apex. And the, for me, the interesting thing about this, these pro cone problems is you have quantized defects because you have a pneumatic or something on a cone, but there's gonna be the equivalent of a fractional charge that can be anything. It's unquantized at the cone apex, interacting with these uh, various defects that are on the flanks. The question is, how does that, how does that work? Um, so uh, here's an unrolled cone. This has far too many angles for, for anyone to uh, actually follow what's going on. But suffice it to say is that this is a, an unrolled cone. This phi in this unrolled coordinate system doesn't go from zero to two pi. It goes from zero to two pi chi, where chi is the fraction of the um, cone that you removed, or the fraction of the disk you you've, uh, remove to make this unrolled cone. And what you've done, it turns out, is, is to gauge all the geometrical frustration onto the seam where this, uh, this, this cone comes together. And that turns out to be a very useful change of variables. It gets rid of the vector potential. Uh, it gauges it onto, a, on, every, on every circle, gauges it onto a point at the seam. And you end up with something that looks like garden variety two-dimensional XY model, but the angular variable of the space where this field, uh, this angle psi lives, doesn't go from zero to two pi, it goes from zero to two pi chi. And then there's a boundary condition on psi as you, to, that connects what's going on here to here. And that boundary condition is equivalent to having an additional unquantized topological charge at the apex. That's, that's, the, that's the essence of it. So this is a, this is, comes from the apex, and then this comes from whatever defects are enclosed in this loop. There's an apex contribution and a defect contribution. And from this little uh, argument, you can compute um, the ground state and the ground state energy for free boundary conditions. So that's the first thing I'll talk about. Even free boundary conditions is kind of tricky, um, but you'll find that, uh, uh, except for these core energies, uh, there's a, uh, a logarithmic uh, a dependence on the size, and then there's an effective apex charge, uh, which is given by the minimum of minus chi, that's the, the uh, Gaussian curvature uh, at the apex, it comes in as a, with a minus sign, plus some integer number of defects, each of charge one over p, and not surprisingly, you try to make this as small as possible, uh, canceling out this apex charge, but since the apex charge isn't quantized, you can't cancel it in general. And as a result, uh, there's a, typically a logarithm with a prefactor that's given by the square of this apex charge. Um, and uh, if you look at the free boundary condition problem here, both representations uh, unrolled and rolled up cones, uh, these are the ground states. This is combing the hair of a pneumatic on a cone with free boundary conditions. Um, and uh, these are the apex charges for the various p-addicts 
at the different values of chi that we've been able to investigate uh, numerically. And you know, when we first saw this table with numbers like minus 1 20th and plus 1 12th, et cetera, uh, our question at least was who ordered that? Where did this table come from? And eventually this argument about uh, canceling the, much of the apex charge as possible worked and uh, we can get uh, a, a collapse of all these um, uh, textures onto this uh, single formula for the energy. Some of them have essentially zero energy because you've completely canceled uh, the apex charge, but in general, you can't do that. Okay. Any questions about free boundary conditions? Yes, please. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, it turns out that it, it doesn't. Um, the, the defects that uh, are on the flanks typically are well down the flanks. They're nowhere near the apex. And you can decapitate the cone. We snipped off the top and we redid the minimization. And basically nothing changed except for the core energy. So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, but it doesn't seem to matter. Much like the aronoff bohm experiment where the width of the solenoid doesn't matter. What matters is the flux to the solenoid. Other questions? Okay, so um, the, uh, let's see if I can make this advance. Tangential boundary conditions is another story. And, and, and uh, they are themselves incompatible with parallel transport. Here's tangential boundary conditions for a cone. This is what parallel transport wants to do. Suppose it's tangential down here. And if it tries to make things as parallel as possible, consistent with the geometry of the cone, it's gonna rotate uh, away from tangent, ten, a tangent boundary condition. So something else has to happen here. And it's not hard numerically uh, to uh, figure out uh, uh, what, what happens. Uh, this is one of our cone ground states with uh, tangential boundary conditions with pneumatogens and uh, we, you might be, it's useful, uh, helpful to try to guess what's going to happen. So I'm going to do that with another baseball. Okay. Now this baseball has a red equator going around uh, that splits it into a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. It's the same kind of baseball I just passed around. And um, it's also kind of like a, an unholy uh, hybrid of American baseball and cricket. It's, you know, offspring that you probably wouldn't want to uh, uh, have too many of. Uh, in any event, um, the Gadakin experiment is take the northern hemisphere with its smoothed out rounded Gaussian curvature and slowly deform it into a pointy cone. Do the same with the southern hemisphere. Now you, I thought, well, if you start with two defects here, uh, it's just gonna stay two defects. And it, that's a possibility. Of course, I, I, can, uh, I can pass this around if you'd like. Uh, here, the uh, 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 but in fact, what we got was uh, this thing here, and yeah, and there's a defect. Uh, there's the baseball texture, the Gadakin experiment I was just talking about. There's a defect. There's a plus one half defect. You have to take my word for it with this particular paper construction, but there's no defect on the back. There's not two defects on this thing, there's one. And for those of you who are skeptical, I actually made uh, a few little models here. So uh, if you could pass these around, uh, you can see there's one on the front and not one on the back. Now, what's happening? Well, it turns out that the apex has eaten uh, one of the defects. So in contrast to a hemisphere with these uh, tangential uh, boundary conditions, there's just one plus defect, plus one defect. One of them has been eaten, as I said. Uh, and so for P equals um, two, these, pneumatic, these pneumatics, I start with a disk, that's chi equals zero. I make it into a slightly pointy cone or somewhat pointy cone with chi equals one third and, the, and, and one of the defects gets eaten. And by the time I get up to chi equals two thirds, it eats both of them. It's a very hungry apex. And so uh, this is the beautiful uh, 
uh, combing hair of the sphere. Uh, but, and of course, Poincare hop theorem is not wrong, it, 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 but when you have these pointy singularities, singularities can eat uh, a uh, interesting number of the defects that you might think were there because of Poincare hops considerations. Um, how do we get these results? <clears throat> well, uh, we got them numerically first, but Farzan Fafa realized that uh, you can use um, isothermal coordinates in the complex plane, just as you would in a, in a disk and standard uh, problems in electrostatics uh, to enforce the uh, tangential boundary conditions. And uh, so this is, a, this is a metric for those of you uh, that are uh, au courant with uh, isothermal coordinates. Uh, you can, this is a beautiful theorem that says that in, in any two dimensional surface, you can just uh, pull things out. It looks a diagonal metric with a, with a prefactor. Now in this case, the prefactor depends on the apex charge in a non-trivial way. Um, so we take uh, the, the cone in the original coordinate system, we smash it down into uh, the complex plane, not, uh, not, not cutting and unrolling it, it's real complex plane where the angle goes around uh, two pi. Uh, and now uh, what you do to enforce the tangential boundary conditions is for each defect inside a rim, uh, we take uh, the uh, spherical image or the circular image uh, defect outside. We take it to be a like sign defect and take my word for it, that will enforce the tangential boundary conditions. So that tells us what we need to know to get the ground states here, uh, as I'll show you. Um, so uh, if we do this thing, um, there's a whole bunch of, in this, in this cool coordinate system that Farzan uh, used in his calculations. Here are the charges, uh, go back here. Here are the charges, plus or minus a half, plus or minus one sixth, whatever they are, um, associated with, with any defects that might be present. And then there are all these strange terms, but there's a finite number of them. Uh, here's the cone apex. It acts like its own little charge, not quantized, interacting with the quantized charges here. Here's a plus, and then here's an image plus. Here's another plus, here's its image plus. And so there's a repulsion between the defects in, on the flanks of the cone. In this coordinate system, this is the repulsion from the other defects image. This is the repulsion from their own image. Uh, and this is the, these two terms are the interactions with the apex. You put all these things together, you can actually figure out what these ground states should look like analytically. And uh, the uh, sum, sum, summary is that there is a sequential eating, like the god Cronos ate his children uh, in Greek mythology, uh, and a sequential eating for, for these piatics uh, of these defects. And uh, here, for these positively uh, charged cones, um, the, 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 these conventional cones uh, is a comparison of, of, of theory uh, and, and numerics, and this is the number of flank charges as for P equals two, three, four, five, and six. And uh, I hope you'll agree that uh, this theory does a pretty good job. And then this is the position of these flank charges as a function of chi uh, as well. So any questions before I move on to active dynamics? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, so it depends a little bit on how you do it. If it's a very shallow cone, um, uh, you, then you might think that's not a, a big, uh, big perturbation. But for this case, it turns out that um, one is eaten immediately. You have to wait till chi equals a half for the second to be eaten. For the hyperbolic cones, which I'll talk about if there's time at the end, um, you make it a little bit hyperbolic, start with two in a disk, let's say, make it a little bit hyperbolic, and uh, it, it still stays two for a while. So hyperbolic and uh, cones and regular cones are actually fundamentally different. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Okay, so let's move on. And you know, we we're supposed to talk about living matter, and I haven't done a lot of living things here uh, yet. But um, of course, there are many experts on uh, uh, active pneumatics in the audience. 
And we could coat a cone, we meaning Amin Dost Bahamadi and Farzan Fafa, who, who ran the code that I'll, I'll show you, uh, for P equals two, uh, a nomadic uh, order parameter here. Um, and these are uh, fairly uh, standard equations that uh, you can look at to figure out the dynamics if you have uh, activity. And uh, you know, foremost experts on activity are in the audience, so I, I, I will not uh, dwell on this, but there's this beautiful uh, observation uh, that uh, there's an active component of the stress that's proportional to this QIJ tensor that's often used to model pneumatics. And um, uh, there's a, a kind of advection of the different components of QIJ in the dynamics. There can be rotation and shear contributions. And this is a local molecular field that you get by differentiating uh, a Landau de Gen free energy. So that tells you the dynamics of the Q tensor. Then there's a velocity field. If it's activity, you have a defect, they act like comets and they buzz around. And uh, so there's a shear viscosity, there's a pressure if you want to enforce incompressibility. Here's this active term in the stress tensor. And if it's on a, uh, a, a substrate, there's probably there's a friction that probably dominates. So what uh, Farzan and Amin did was just take the simplest version of this model, which when you write it in terms of these conformal uh, coordinates, it doesn't look simple, <laughs> at least to me, but um, it, it, it's a compact way of writing things. The same trick works in the dynamics that uh, gave us the nice results for the ground states. And we just work in a simple overdamped limit where there's this activity parameter that as many of you know, can be positive or negative. So we did some simulations for uh, contractile, I think, uh, active pneumatics on a cone. Uh, we neglected the flow alignment parameter. Uh, we worked at an overdamp limit. There's no thermal noise. There's a whole question. What does a costulous thalus transition look like on a cone? I don't know. I have some speculations, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to look at dynamics, like if you like it, very low temperature. And um, the uh, so here's here's a disk. Let's start with a disk. Start with something simple. And remember, we had this ground state without activity where these um, uh, uh, defects went out and then they, they didn't go all the way to the edge because they had their image, um, a like signed image defect. And we turn on activity uh, and what happened? They orbit around uh, the disk and they have uh, their polarization uh, vector that, uh, uh, or anti-parallel, we can show that that's the case uh, for this model. And then this angle phi is conserved as you go around. And this was done uh, partly to make th things more visual with 45 degree anchoring boundary conditions. It's not tangential, but it's fixed in 45 degrees. But now let's turn it into a cone and ask what happens, right? It's supposed to eat one of its children, maybe. Um, the uh, so this is a fairly pointy cone with chi equals three fifths. That means we've removed three fifths of a disc and we've glued it back together again. This is a top view if you like, but it's in these conformal coordinates. So here's the apex and let's see what happens. We start with two defects on the flanks, a non-quantized defect at the apex and it eats one. And uh, uh, Okay, what else can you do here? Well, um, the uh, let's have a look. Uh, make this go forward. Oh, the, the, how many of you seen the movie Oppenheimer? Anybody seen Oppenheimer? Well, there's one point early in the movie where someone says, oh, Oppenheimer, I like your theory of molecules. That's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation where you assume that uh, electrons are very light and nimble and simply follow um, instantaneously uh, the coordinates of the nuclei. And you can get a very heavy nuclei don't move much. So the electrons just constantly adjust and you get a nice theory of the chemical bond. That's one of Oppenheimer's contributions to science. Uh, so there's a Born-Oppenheimer approximation here too. So there's the motion of the defects. Those are like the nuclei. And then there's the texture. Um, 
and it, it's it's sort of on the borderline of of working. Uh, and so uh, we luckily we have these numerics. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It usually works, but it, it can give you testable predictions. So in this case, it seemed to work. Okay, now I want to have a fairly pointy cone. Three fifths of the material of a disk is moved. And instead of having a three body problem, I'm going to try to convince you that we get a four body problem uh, on the flanks of the cone. Um, there's an effective charge of minus one, minus three fifths, because uh, that, that's the way it works out. Um, and, but we're going to make the activity a little larger. Let's take a look and see what happens. Let's watch a little bit more. <clears throat> it emits uh, minus one half defects from the apex, which then track down the hapless plus one half defect and annihilate it. It's like a kamikaze drone. Um, there we go. So this thing got emitted. It's a, it, if you look carefully, it's a, it's, a, it's a minus one half defect. It's going to track down this thing. Minus one half defects aren't supposed to move in active pneumatics typically. But this one does probably because it's distorted. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a texture is distorted uh, by the, the, near, the proximity of, of the apex. Uh, so uh, we're still investigating this. This hasn't. Uh, this is still active uh, investigation, but uh, I think it's kind of cool that the apex of a cone acts like a lightning rod. And there's a kind of dielectric breakdown when the activity gets high enough, just like you would have in a lightning rod, and it can emit uh, defects and change the, the, uh, the, the state uh, in this active uh, situation. Okay, um, uh, questions about this before I, I, I wind up with hyperbolic cone? Yeah, yes, please. The velocity is just slavery. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. I've forgotten. Uh, I I think it's just slaved to what the QIJ is doing at the boundary. That's that's, that's uh, I'd have to go back and check. That's a good question. So, so what, what, we, what, what we, we do actually have them initially. So what we do, um, Prasad, is to, is to start with a, a disk-like boundary condition with the tangential stuff, and then make it into a cone, readjust, then turn on the activity and see what happens. And then they, they crank up and start moving, and you get these orbiting things, and then you get things spit out and so forth. I haven't told you what happens for large chi and large activity when we get them really large. Uh, we're still investigating that, but uh, summary of what I've said so far is that uh, you know when when, when these these a defect that we might want to go to the apex, for example, there's a capture radius problem. There's an impact parameter uh, as it as it shoots up the flank of a cone. Uh, if, if it's outside this this radius. Uh, it, it goes out toward the flank, but if it's inside, it gets captured. Um, the, uh, the, there's an interesting balance between Coulomb interactions between defects and interactions with the, the, the apex. And this is our first attempt to draw a kind of phase diagram as a function of activity and this cone deficit angle. Um, and uh, so there, there are regions where we do get two defects. They, 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 uh, I mentioned that when you turn on a chi, it goes from two to one immediately, but that's with activity, you can have two that hang around longer. And then you go to one defect and then uh, go across this red line and we get this sort of intermittent uh, oscillation between two and one. And uh, there's some kind of dynamical systems problem here uh, that uh, we'd like to understand better. And, uh, I think they, they call this chaos because we really don't understand what's going on there. <laughs> uh, okay, any questions about active matter on cones before I finish up with uh, 
the uh, hyperbolic uh, stuff. Yes, please. One is, um, you know, if when you, when you look at the core, when you look at things with a boundary. Yes. Uh, so let's say you have a, a, a disk with a wedge cut out. Yeah. Uh, a situation in which that could arise without actually a physical boundary is if you had a face separation. Uh -huh. uh, meaning this business of edges or singularities eating defects mm -hmm. can happen even in systems without an actual boundary if there's okay. an interface between a dense region where you have pneumatic order, for instance, okay. and a low density region. Right. Isn't that right? So I mean, you oh, can, Yeah, I, I think that's, that's fair. If you that, have that, a face adjacent. That's you looked at. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's perfectly fair. And uh, it's a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, in electrostatics, uh, if you have a free boundary, uh, by, you, if you have, depends on the boundary condition, but if, if for example, uh, you have um, to satisfy the boundary condition, an opposite signed image charge, right? Then that that can be ripped apart, and effectively you'll be spitting a, a new uh, defect into the system. Um, those are typically planar line-like boundaries. Um, so this is a yeah. point-like version of, of a similar thing. And in fact, to make it your uh, comment more uh, vivid, for a cone, if I decapitate the cone, then I have a rim. And you can think of this uh, dynamics of emission and absorption as uh, uh, in being engendered by what happens as you go across that rim. So it's point-like rather than line-like, but I agree with you. The other even more detailed nerdy question. You said you uh, didn't look at the flow coupling. Does that mean that uh, the... Um, that you ignored even the rotation of orientation by the vorticity. That is, did you set the entire flow coupling term S of EQ to zero, or did you just work with? Uh, I, okay, I, I think I can. I, I, I want to. I want to be, be careful here because, but, but, um, I, I think we have some of it I see, see because we have this. We have this one, and which is the analog of what's in here. One of the things in here. So you don't have the. Sort of alignment by the symmetric part of the velocity gradient, but you have the rest of it. That's right. That's right. So the, I think they, uh, the, the motivation here was just to do the simplest thing first. And then uh, the boundary condition question is, is, is this thing here that we just did, took the overlap, overdamp limit and slaved it, as you suggested, Prasad. Thank you. Great questions. Any other questions before I make a brief excursion into hyperbolic space? Um, I'm going to probably finish, uh, Ranjini, uh, in 15 minutes or so, and that should give us a little time if you want to do awards or something and don't want to miss lunch, whatever. Okay, good. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let me fast forward here uh, and tell you a little bit about hyperbolic cones. This may be only 10 minutes. Um, the, uh, uh, the, so, um, we started to investigate ground states of hyperbolic cones. We haven't put activity on, although I think that certainly in the, in the plan. Um, so hyperbolic cones in a sense are complement to conventional cones. Let me tell you what they are. So uh, here I have a disc and we've talked about a lot about discs and I, I'll cut it down the middle, uh, half all the way to the center. Having done that, I can remove a slice and glue it back together again, all right? Remove a piece of pizza and you can take your pizza pie and make it into a cone if you're not hungry. Um, uh, uh, you can also uh, insert a slice. And if you insert a slice, you'll get one of these uh, 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 objects like, like what I'm holding up here. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks sort of like a flower. Um, and less familiar than a cone, but it too has zero Gaussian curvature everywhere. If I cut it open, I can just sort of wrap it around uh, the, uh, I think I have, a, I have one that's, that, that's wrapped around. So, so I'll pass this around if people are interested. Uh, you, can, you can sort of do this to it, but you can see it's always flat. It's just multiple value in certain places. So uh, if you want to play with this, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to have some of these toys back. 
but um, uh, the uh, uh, mostly I want the baseball stuff. Um, these paper things I can make very easily. Uh, in any event, it, it's an object which um, has zero Gaussian curvature, except possibly at the at, at the origin at, at its vertex. And so, um, and in fact, when we insert a, a, you know a slice which is a integral multiple of sixty degrees, for example, we'll get a negative disclination. In fact, and we can do simulations of Meyer Salpa liquid crystal models on uh, on regular lattices and uh, try to figure out what's going on with the ground states. So. Um, Here's a one way of going after the hyperbolic cone coordinates that Grace Zhang uh, figured out. Um, there's sort of two possible radial coordinates. We'll go, we can go back and forth between them if we want. One is the, the distance, the straight line distance. This is a ruled surface. I can go off in any direction. It's a straight line, right? That's a, another way of saying it has zero Gaussian curvature. Uh, but then in, in the projection, there's, there's a, a radial vector R, which is gonna come in, in a minute. So there's this rho and then there's this R. And then uh, corresponding to the projected angle theta, there's the R theta coordinates of the projected hyperbolic cone shape. Uh, there's gonna be an angle like this that goes around. And just like the angle for the, uh, the cut open uh, rolled out cone uh, goes from uh, zero, to two pi chi, not all the way to two pi, this one goes a little bit more around. And, and, and actually calculating this V in terms of theta uh, requires uh, elliptical integrals of the second and third kind. It's not, not trivial in calculation, at least for me. Um, so let's take a look at the parameterization that might give us some insights into these hyperbolic cones. Um, this is a, a sort of fairly standard cone parameterization in terms of the R and theta variables that you might naturally uh, describe motivated by the base. The, the cone uh, half angle comes in in this representation in terms of the cotangent of beta or minus the cotangent of beta. But here's another more interesting thing. By the way, this chi, which has an analog, I have to tell you what that analog is for a hyperbolic cone, is one minus sine beta for a regular cone. Um, now, hyperbolic cone, here's a parameterization. Now this, it turns out to be an exact solution to the Foppel von Karman equations uh, uh, for uh, a disclination in the limit of infinite uh, Young's modulus. So it, 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 it's an excellent approximation uh, for what goes on for a piece of paper in particular. It has a huge Young's modulus compared to its spinning energy. The only parameter is this A. And if you think about it, what this is saying is that there's a whole bunch of rays that make up the surface. And the height of the surface is A times cosine two theta. So it goes up in two directions and down in, two, in, in the other two directions. So it's a saddle, a rather uncomfortable saddle. I'm not sure I'd want to sit on it very long, but um, uh, the rate at which it goes up and the maximum, uh, two maximal directions this way, and the rate that goes down in these directions is A. And A is gonna play the role of beta, the cone half angle. But it's a quite uh, uh, more complicated than you might think. So what do we know about regular cones? Well, we, I showed you that this, uh, the integrated Gaussian curvature is two pi times one minus cosine beta, that's two pi chi. It could be here. And uh, this gamma is the sine beta. And you know, as, as, you, as, as beta goes from uh, zero to pi over two or whatever, this goes from zero to one. So we wanna find out, what Grace wanted to find out as well, is what's the analog of this sine beta parameter for a hyperbolic cone? Turns out this lies between one and two. And uh, one minus gamma then lies between uh, zero and minus one. So that's what we're gonna find out. And we can work out the differential geometry of these things. Um, uh, metric tensor, important thing, right? We already, uh, so this is the metric tensor <laughs> for hyperbolic cones. 
not as user friendly as the metric tensor for a regular cone. Um, but there it is. Uh, notice it has a, a fourfold symmetry in theta. Um, and you know, it's fun to work out the directions of principal curvature. They twist around in, in a beautiful way. Um, and if we continue our exploration of this differential geometry problem, well, Gauss Binet comes to help us. And uh, it turns out that uh, what, what, just like for a regular cone, uh, the integrated Gaussian curvature, that's what we might want to know. That's the strength of the delta function at the apex of this hyperbolic cone. Uh, there's a geodesic curvature integral as well. And then this is the, the uh, Euler characteristic, which is one for a disk and also for a cone and a hyperbolic cone. Um, and then you have to calculate the geodesic curvature, which you, which you can do. Uh, and involves something, tells you something about the normals. What are the normals doing as I go around on this path? And you might remember one of uh, Gauss's favorite theorems, um, theorem egregium, the egregiously bad theorem, or whatever, whatever he called it in Latin. Um, you, you, you take these, these uh, black arrows, these, these little unit normals to the surface, and they make a little loop on the inner sphere. And the area of that sphere is the, is the Gaussian curvature. That's the, this is one of his favorite theorems. So Grace worked this out and she got this, what she calls uh, gamma tilde. That's the sine beta equivalent of a hyperbolic cone. And it has and it fun, it's a, fun, it's a function of that parameter A that uh, we used to describe the cone. Uh, it's given by, this delightful formula here. What is this strange pi function? Well, we're in Ramanujan Hall, and I suspect he would know what this is. Uh, this is the incomplete elliptical integral of the third kind. Um, and, uh, and lo and behold, if you plot this thing, the total Gaussian uh, curvature around a hyperbolic cone, uh, as I vary A, so I'm now varying this A parameter, uh, starts at zero and it eventually can be minus two pi. So by choosing A, you can get a whole range of lovely uh, Gaussian curvatures, minus two pi over three, minus two pi, et cetera. So we, we, we think we have control over the analog of the chi parameter for uh, a disk. And, um, and we can also do these minimizations. Um, so there's a geometrical apex charge, chi, uh, and it lies between minus one and zero. So we can take the, all that stuff I told you about for positive chi and ask the same questions for a negative chi. And I think I just have time to just hit the highlights and then we'll have an award ceremony probably before lunch. Um, so uh, we did this lattice model that I already mentioned and, you know, uh, make these nice lattices by just putting in uh, extra extra stuff. And I'll just show you the result. I thought it was a good place to uh, uh, end. All right, so um, this is a disc. We can distort the disc into a hyperbolic cone just as well as a regular cone. Um, and so this is a, a disc that, uh, uh, this is the one I, I think it's the one I'm passing around. Um, but, if you take this, so what's shown here is, 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 a, is an order parameter texture on the left, pneumatic order parameter texture. This is going around and then there's an extra piece over here that's sort of lying underneath this one. And then you have to glue it together into the third dimension. So uh, this is the answer to the question, what happens if you make chi reasonably non-negative, but small here, it stays, with just two defects, these, these little uh, red, uh, these little blue triangles are the, where the defects are in these textures. So I'll pass this around um, yeah. and you can look and, and uh, marvel at the beauty of hyperbolic cone. But guess what? When you, you, you make chi minus one half, you now get re defects. So uh, the system uh, emits uh, uh, I think that one, that one maybe has three, and this one has two. Um, 
So uh, we are not getting defects eating, eaten uh, by the apex of the hyperbolic cone plus one half defects. We are getting them uh, expelled. And uh, the, uh, so this, this, is a, these are, this is a picture of what I'm just handing out, uh, handing around chi equals minus one third, uh, chi equals minus one half. Two, two uh, plus one half defects, uh, whoops, two plus one half defects here, three here. And if you make it really, really hyperbolic, you get four. Um, we don't know the chi values that where these transitions happen other than numerically. We haven't yet taken this cute trick uh, that uh, Farzan came up with and successfully applied it. We're trying. Um, what we think is going on to go from two to three is that uh, sort of like that uh, active matter thing. Uh, if you imagine a, a minus one half and a plus one half uh, being ripped apart uh, on the flanks of the hyperbolic cone, there are two plus one halves. This minus one half goes in and knocks down the charge at the center by a half, leaving three on the flanks. That's our, that's our guess uh, as to what happens. So, I've told you a lot of stuff. I thank you for your patience and, and your questions. Told you mostly about uh, ground states on cones, regular cones. Um, and I've told you how to comb the hair of a, of a cone. <laughs> and so here's with free boundary conditions. This is a nice hairstyle here for this cone. But now with the tangential boundary conditions, one of the defects in this case have gotten eaten. Um, we've talked a little bit about hyperbolic cones. Just a comment about cones, maybe not everybody knows this. Geodesics are absolutely fascinating on cones. Um, you know, uh, uh, if, if I have two points here and here, there are at least three geodesic curves that connect the two points. There's a shortest one, which is blue. There's a green one and a red one. And the red one almost looks like a slingshot orbit of a comet going around, uh, a point mass at the apex. So that's something we're, we're trying to think about also. Um, and uh, as I said, you can take this cone, the ground state here, I, I've changed the chi, but, that, but, but what more importantly, I've now de decapitated it. And uh, we have a, a rim at the top, uh, but if the size of the decapitation is small compared to the overall size of the cone flanks, nothing changes. So this is robust uh, to decapitation. Um, and uh, uh, this is another cone geodesic that I couldn't resist showing. It's a very pointy cone indeed. Chi is almost equal to uh, one. And uh, it starts down here. It goes around, 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 around. And then it gets like a boomerang. It gets reflected back before it ever gets anywhere near the apex. So. Uh, cone geodesics are interesting. And with that, I will stop. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your questions. Thank you, Professor, for that insightful talk. Now, question answers. Thank you, Steve. I said, Okay, um, just one slide back when you uh, decapitated yes. your cone, the boundary condition I just so uh, changed Well, on the top. Yeah, so it, it, it changed in a sense, but it didn't change much because what we have at the top is free boundary conditions. So right. it's when, when you decapitate, and in, in effect, we always have to decapitate because there's always one missing point at the top. And so we just let the three, if there are three neighboring things uh, for an undecapitated cone uh, at the top, uh, we just let them do what they want. And we do that here. So effectively the boundary condition at the top is, is free, but it's a very tightly uh, circumscribed uh, circle because you're just de uh, decapitating a little bit. So what I'm thinking is if you just, uh, you know, uh, increase the, length of the decapitation. But increase the length of uh, the decapitation. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. 
And what it depends on is the size of the flanks. So it's, it's a geometrical thing. And as long as this circle, this circumference is small to the circumference at the base with the tangential boundary conditions, um, things don't seem to matter. Uh, clearly, if you decapitate more and more, eventually you'll just get a kind of a, a, a tilted ribbon. Mm. One of the things I hope to uh, persuade uh, your colleague, Denis Bartolo to do is to do his quinky rollers on a bank track. Uh, sort of like uh, these cycle competitions in the Olympics where people are going around and around and they should be picking up. Exactly, exactly. So I want him to, I, I, he has many better things to do, I'm sure, but I'm hoping he will make a banked version of what he did, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's true, that's true. You, you could density match. Oh, yes, yeah. So in terms of the boundary conditions, yes. Um, what I, I'm actually not clear, uh, what actually changes with the boundary condition from the free to the tank? Well, it's a, it, 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 so the important thing that happened is um, the image charges. And one way to think about it is in terms of this representation in terms of uh, isothermal coordinates or conformal coordinates. Um, with the free boundary condition, the image charge has uh, equal and opposite charge to the, uh, the charge that uh, engendered it in the first place. With the tangential, it's a like sign charge. So with tangential boundary conditions, any defect inside can never escape because as it goes to the boundary, a like sign image charge will come up and repel it. With the free boundary conditions, it's an unlike sign and so things will tend naturally to annihilate easily uh, at free boundary conditions which is why this cone tip when truncated at least uh, can easily emit uh, and absorb defects so that and next uh, yeah. just taking one more time uh, question sure. um, so these um, liquid crystals are there on a lattice on the yep. surface yep. Mm -hmm. and uh, so if i allow them to move uh -huh. on the surface yes mm -hmm. on the curvature yep. so in that case um those those positional defects will uh, start appearing well um so the ground states that i've talked about for simplicity we put it on a lattice and uh, we don't think that's going to change the character of the, of the of the ground state very much but when i did the active matter stuff with uh uh, Fafa and Dos Mohammadi, we were off lattice. And when it started to flow, there was no lattice, where well, there was maybe some mesh, but it wasn't on these regular Meyer Selpa lattices. So we just used the Meyer Selpa to get ground state. And regarding the mesh, you, you, you mentioned that you have to be real careful how to prepare the mesh. Correct. Can you, can you say something about that? Sure. If, if you take a piece of um, triangular graph paper, say that's going to be my mesh, and you cut out a piece and you glue it back together again. Unless that cutout is an integral multiple of 60 degrees, it's not gonna to come together smoothly. And your mesh is gonna have a whole seam of singularities or, or you know, anomalous coordination numbers. And we didn't wanna to have to worry about healing that artificial uh, a line of uh, anomalous coordination numbers, artificial if it were a liquid that we're trying to simulate. And so, um, there, there's a special set of commands, there are seven of them, uh, that allow you to have a tile, a cone with a square lattice or a triangular lattice. Any more questions? Okay, then once again, let's thank the speaker.